And I had forgotten, actually, to give you a disclosure slide. I am a consultant for Core Matrix and have been for a long time. And uh, actually, I'm very proud of that. I just read an article <laughs> yesterday that said that doctors who get as little as a $20 dinner from a drug company will prescribe their drug more often. You're not getting me out for a $20 dinner. And uh, so that's all that silliness. Uh, I've worked very closely with these guys from day one. Um, I took a deep dive into the science early on. And I think that uh, my patients have benefited from it quite a bit. I've benefited from it professionally and intellectually. And this next thing that I'm going to talk about is um, one of the I think hallmark events in cardiac surgery. It's been a little bit under the radar, and people have thrown stones at us a little bit about it, um, but eventually uh, we are proving that this is gonna happen. So the question became, could we build a whole valve? Because not everybody can do all that stuff that I showed you earlier, quite honestly. The patient's gonna show up with that big Mongo uh, infection of their valve, and they're going to get their valve taken out, and they're going to get a mechanical valve put in. Or what about uh, all the third world countries where millions of young people have rheumatic valve disease, and they have no good option? They're living in the middle of India, and they put a tissue valve in you, and you're 14 years old. The valve's going to be burned through in six years, five years, four years. If they put a mechanical valve in you, somehow do you manage your anticoagulation? So what if uh, we could provide surgeons with an option that would allow the patient to grow a new valve? And this was absolutely the most exciting idea that we, we could possibly grab onto. And it was really the trajectory that I was most interested in. Everything else, so, you know, the stuff for heart failure and all that I thought was fabulous. The pocket for the pacemaker, wonderful. It doesn't have anything to do with my life. But it does, the idea that we would be able to impact valve surgery on a global level is very exciting. So where would be the proof of, proof of concept? The proof of concept for us was to go after the tricuspid valve in humans. What uh, had been shown earlier by Dr. Menauer is, was a pulmonic valve, pulmonic valve conduit uh, that's been used in children actually, uh, OUS, outside the US, and some in the US, a few in the US. But the tricuspid was the lowest hanging fruit because it was low pressure system. We didn't counter enough in adults. Um, and there was already a methodology that had been developed. Um, so how is it that we get where we're going with this? You know, the, the idea of regeneration, essentially what we're trying to do is recapitulate embryogenesis. We're trying to get to happen in an adult what happens in us as a fetus. Um, and is kind of mind-blowing as that seems, if you look through the literature, and there are, I think, something like 11,000 publications on this subject, we've had this steady growth and understanding over the last few decades of what that would take, what it means, what happens to not only pluripotential cells, but differentiated cells. How do they behave when they're in a, uh, in a healthy matrix or a different kind of matrix? And one of, the, one of the people that I think is absolutely the cornerstones of our progress in this field globally is Rob Matheny, who's the heart surgeon turned scientist, chief scientific officer for Core Matrix. And the reason I say that is because Rob recognized that there were multiple silos of information and they were not communicating. He would go to these meetings. I went to some of these basic science meetings with Rob. And people would get up and talk about one protein in a matrix. And they would have, these guys would be devoting their entire life to a single protein. Extracellular matrix has got 350, 380 different proteins in it. To think that you were going to identify the one protein that was the key element in turning the key and making all this happen seemed a little obscure, to say the least. And then there were the silos between matrix and stem cells. So we have, as you know, billions of dollars have been spent injecting stem cells into everything, every organ. And we haven't grown anything yet. 
you've had a little bit of improvement in function, probably due to a paracrine effect, and maybe some traction in a few situations where cells actually grabbed on and were able to survive for a while. But in general, they don't. Why don't they survive? They don't survive because they're not in the right environment to do so. So if we're going to generate, it's not so much generation, right? So if we cut a valve out, put a new valve in, and it becomes tissue, it's not so much regeneration, it's generation, we're going to try and recapitulate embryogenesis. In order to do that, we have to have a proliferative matrix. We have to have a matrix that promotes cellular growth uh, and that allows pluripotential cells to occupy the matrix. We have to modulate and limit the inflammatory response, as was mentioned by both of us earlier, that when the initial inflammatory response begins, we need some of that, but we don't want it to continue on into the kind of standard route for an adult, which is scar formation. And then finally, form follows function. That's actually a, a phrase that some of you may recognize uh, from Louis Sullivan, who was an architect in, Ch in Chicago. Uh, and if you read uh, Devil in a White City, they talk about him a little bit. Uh, but that concept actually kind of pours over in everything that we think about. In other words, the form of something uh, becomes dependent on what the function is and what the uh, inherent design properties are. If you look at how cells behave in different uh, ECMs, these are the composition of different ECMs, fetal, ne fetal neo neonatal, adult ECM. So taking the same cells, the same neonatal uh, cardiomyocytes, or pluripotential even uh, cardiomyocytes, at the very beginning of their growth, and we exposing them to different matrices, we see that growth is different. So these uh, this stain, basically, this PHH3 positive cells, those are cells that are pluripotential that have the ability to differentiate and grow. And in fetal and neonatal ECM, we see that there is a considerably greater expansion of those cells, uh, and specifically also myocytes. So the expansion of myocytes in the fetal and neonatal extracellular matrix is greater than it is in adult extracellular matrix. So the matrix itself, that structure, is different in those categories, and the matrix itself then influences the growth and expansion and multiplication of those cells. You guys are all familiar with newts growing limbs, right? The most fascinating thing we've ever seen. It's been go we've known about that since we were children. You cut, the you cut the limb off of a newt, and that newt will grow his limb back. And how does that happen? Well, nobody understood it, and they're starting to. And as it turns out, it's probably because of the extracellular matrix. So this is a, these are actually slices through the heart of a newt. So you chop the tip of the heart of a newt off, it grows, its, it grows the tip of the heart back. It's like it does a limb. And it appears to be related to the early laydown of a specialized extracellular matrix. And that matrix, even in the adult newt or the grown newt, is fetal or neonatal in characteristic. So it's an extracellular matrix that's ready to grow cells, to have cells multiply in it. Not only can a youthful extracellular matrix allow for pluripotential cells to gather, grow, and differentiate, but that, extra, that youthful extracellular matrix can reverse the activity of cells. So we had this concept for decades that heart muscle was finite. You would, uh, a, a heart muscle cell would go under, undergo about 50 divisions, and that was it, it was over. It was not coming back, end of the cell, apoptosis, it checks out, you check out. Well, as it turns out, it's not necessarily true because you can take senescent cells, you can take, you can take a senescent fibroblast, a, uh, a cell that has, is at end of life, essentially. Uh, and as you guys may or may not know or remember, and seen in biology class, the telomeres, right? The telomeres are at the tips of our chromosomal material, and those te telomeres shorten over time. It's basically kind of the burnout of your chromosomal material. In an appropriate extracellular matrix, in a youthful extracellular matrix, those telomeres will relengthen. So this is a reversal of that pattern. Why does that happen? It happens because Every cell has got these proteins in it that get turned on and off that tell a cell how to behave. 
And if you turn on the protein that says you're supposed to stick around, then that's what happens. If you take a fetal heart, human fetal heart, or if, uh, any fetal, fetal mammal, and in utero, you injure that myocardium, you injure the heart, it does not scar, it grows back heart. So something changes from when we're in the womb to when we're in the world. And part of that is the alteration in our extracellular matrix. So here again is a depiction just generally to remind you all the things the extracellular matrix is doing. The cell is interacting with it, it adheres. Uh, there's constant change in the molecular communication between the extracellular matrix and the cell. The cell recognizes the nanotopography, the stresses are communicated in the cell through it, and the degradation byproducts of the extracellular matrix, those degradation byproducts influence the cells as well. So all of you have seen, okay, we're gonna build an organ, we're gonna make, it, we're gonna make something and put it in a human body, and the concept has been, the concept generally proffered, has been that we would take cells from the human, they'd be expanded, they'd be put onto a scaffold, the scaffold would be put in a bioreactor. Bioreactor would allow those cells to expand on the scaffold. This, then that new valve or whatever we're implanting would be implanted back into the human. So what we've done instead is to just use the human as the bioreactor. The concept of uh, a tube is not new to either embryology and generation of cardiovascular structures or to the, applic the, uh, the application of uh, tissue constructs in the science of valve surgery. And in fact, the tubular design was initially developed by uh, Jim Cox, who's world famous for the Cox maze procedure, but also had done work in his lab in the 80s, uh, just building entire valves out of a tube, and it went on to be the ATS valve that eventually was bought by Medtronic. When, hopefully you guys will remember uh, when we studied embryology, there was the vascular tube, and it would fold in the fetus, and we watched that in various iterations, in various levels of mammalian development. That tube folds into our cardiovascular system. That tube also develops valves in it. So that initial tubular structure just looks like this. And then once that tube, and you may or may not remember the tube, as it folds, it starts to beat. So the tube starts to beat, and as that happens, as blood is pushed through the tube, as stresses are applied to the, to the walls of that tube, things start to change. So we see that once that happens, there's expansion of embryologic uh, cells that expand into what's called a cardiac jelly, which is a matrix-like substance. And these mesenchymal cells, these are embryologic mesenchymal cells going through transition, remodel, elongate, and eventually develop a valve from a tube. So what we're after here now is we're gonna talk about atrial ventricular valves, we're gonna talk about the tricuspid valve. Tricuspid valve, normal tricuspid valve. For those of you who don't remember, these are chordae, the leaflets are here. This is looking through the tip of the heart. The tip of the right ventricle is splayed open. So we're looking up at the inlet. This would be the inlet from the atrium. These are the leaflets. These are the chordal attachments to the papillary muscles. So normal development of an AV valve from a tube. Well, there's your valve. So uh, Rob Athene, Jim Cox are sitting down chatting. They recognize that the, this very simple design could be applied to the extracellular matrix, and we went off to the races and started doing some animals. So this is the extracellular matrix taken, sewn into a cylinder, and that's the valve. That's what we're gonna use as our valve. We're done building the valve there. This is uh, a sheep, and the valve, tricuspid valve is being excised. I should be using my green pointer. And then the tube that I just showed you is being attached to the papillary muscles at three points, right? The three papillary muscles in a tricuspid valve. That's why a tricuspid valve is tricuspid, because it has three attachments. Those are attached there. Now flip that over, looking down through the atrium, and the, the annulus, annular sutures sewn, and we finish then with pressure underneath there and a trileaflet looking valve. So that was just a cylinder sewn in Attached in three points, sewn to the annulus, pressurized, looks like a tricuspid valve. 
This isn't running. You'll see better pictures in a minute anyway. So this was uh, a publication here. This is Dr. Matheny, Dr. Cox, Anna Fallon. All, uh, they did a series of animals and looked at differentiation in these animals. So this is the extracellular matrix made into that tube, and then the uh, animals harvested over varying segments of time. But this, is, this was at five months in this particular animal. And you can see that there is tissue ingrowth, or tissue uh, growth, I should say, not so much ingrowth, in the uh, now uh, new valve. This was the four-ply. Now, this is a really important point, because we started doing this in humans, and we did it this way. We used the four-ply, which is the standard material presently available off of the shelf. It's four layers of extracellular matrix uh, together, laid together. And so we see here it's a little bit thick. Uh, you start to see these fenestrations here. Those fenestrations are intentional, not intentional by the surgeon, but intentional by Mother Nature, by physiology because those areas are not experiencing stress, so they go away. There's not stress on the material, and that's what I was talking about earlier. So in as much as you need, not anymore, because you want it to experience the stress. If it doesn't experience stress, it goes away. And when we looked at the histopathology, one of the things we learned early, and it was a little bit of a bitter pill because the approved device was a four-ply sheet. Uh, the four-ply developed intralayer thrombus. So some of those, la the layers would float apart a little bit. You could get some blood in there that would induce inflammation, and you'd have thrombus formation, and it wouldn't differentiate perfectly. But when you drop down to a two-ply, it would be, you'd have very little delamination, very little opportunity for blood to get in those layers, and a nice differentiation of the material. So stepping away from the biologic activity, we're going to go back to kind of simple mechanics, or just this concept of a tubular valve to make sure you understand it. This is a paper. I actually wrote the uh, commentary for this paper when it was published. Uh, this, is, this team took some ECM, built the cylinder valves, and then just tested the valve to see how it behaved. Would it behave in its cylinder format like a, a tricuspid valve? And indeed, when they implanted and they compared native to extracellular matrix, the only thing they saw different was a statistically significant difference. It's not a large number, but a statistically significant difference in the annular circumference. And that was because they had sewn it circumferentially, and that, of course, kind of just purse strings the tricuspid annulus down a little bit. Everything else acted like a normal tricuspid valve. So they have, sonomicromet so they have sonomicrometry implanted in the walls of the ventricle and in points on the valve. They're measuring both stress and dimension. And they see the valve actually just in as soon as you implant it is behaving like a normal tricuspid valve. Wear testing, got to do this. If you're going to put this in humans, the government needs it. They have to have the wear testing. So it kind of doesn't make sense for this because it's going to change. But this is one of those hurdles that you have to do. So it testing, and it works fine in the wear testing. Now let's go back to the exciting stuff. So the first larger group of animals was these 20 sheep that Rob did. And this is, again, with the four-ply. Hadn't made the leap to the two-ply yet. But still, nice development. And this is just at three months already. Nice development of the uh, tri-leaflet valve. Under pressure, you see good tissue and growth. This is an absolutely phenomenal paper, and this is probably the most important paper that we have with respect to this technology specific to the tricuspid valve. So David Morales, who's a, uh, the chief of heart, uh, heart surgery at uh, congenital heart surgery at uh, Cincinnati Children's, uh, was, a, was a great skeptic at the beginning. He was like the guy who was always in the room telling us we were wrong. And then he started to do some work. And he did first with myocardium, and then went on to do the tricuspid valve. This was published in JAK. And this, this, in and of itself, this paper would be worth spending a half an hour on all by itself because it has so many important elements of what we're going to talk about. But essentially, this is the two-ply now valve that we've just seen, the cylinder valve implanted in sheep, followed out over time. And as you can see here, over this eight-month period, SASECM, native, or a bioprosthetic, they had a control group with our standard bioprosthetic valves, right? So in sheep, standard bioprosthetic glutaraldehyde-treated valves calcify almost overnight. Honestly, within a couple of months, the thing's a rock. 
But the ECM, what, the, how does the ECM behave? The ECM behaves just like a native valve. These are growing sheep. So they're going in young, the sheep are growing, and the valve is growing with them. And the elastic modulus of that tissue, of those leaflets, is behaving just like a native valve. So this is probably the most important single piece of literature we have to support what we're doing, because we're watching this grow in a developing animal that's doubling or tripling its, si its size. These, this, is the, this is the weight of the animal. So the animal starting at, what is this, maybe 15 kilos and finishing up at 80 kilos. Meanwhile, the valve's just growing with them and acting just like a normal tricuspid valve. Histopathology of this is absolutely remarkable. A normal trilaminar leaflet is found, or near normal at least, endothelial lining, the usual three layers of a, of a, a leaflet. So they had taken uh, a few of those animals and were running them out to 24 months. Uh, everybody was so excited. They did harvest one animal early. This is 18 months. And we see what we have here. We have exactly what we expect. We see chordae forming. These openings expand to form the chordae. Chordae, these openings. These are the papillary muscle attachments, and that's the new tricuspid valve that's grown in that animal. So overlapping that, a couple of years ago, I published along with all these surgeons the national experience with using the four ply version, building the valve at the table, and implanting it in the tricuspid position. We did it for patients with endocarditis. Most of the time, these are people uh, who have used intravenous drugs, not always. Valves have been destroyed, don't have a good option. They're young people. You put a bioprosthetic valve in, they'll burn through it in four, five, six years. Uh, you put a mechanical valve in, good luck trying to anticoagulate them adequately. So, and what we found was that it worked fine. It was a, basically a proof of feasibility, it was a feasibility study, it was a proof of concept. And when I presented this, before I presented it uh, at AATS, I called the FDA to tell them I was going to present it. Because I knew that this was going to be a big leap and I didn't know how comfortable they were going to be. It's so far off label. They were totally fine with it, they said just follow up with a, a genuine study, which is what we've done. Uh, this is an incredible case of Redmond Burke at Miami Children's, uh, an Epstein's anomaly patient. Epstein's is dis uh, uh, displaced tricuspid valve in a very small right ventricle, uh, a complete incompetence essentially in the, valve, the blood uh, not going in its nor usual pattern and uh, an inappropriately sized right ventricle. Uh, Redmond built a new valve for this patient out of the four ply. Now, this is the four ply, so I have to concede that it won't be as perfect, but it's going to work. And this is that same kid at two years of age. So, done as, an, as a neonate or an infant, this is the MRI at two years of age. You know, I'm going to go back to that because I need to, I want, to, I want you to see what we're looking at there in case you don't understand it. So, this is the neo, this is the neo tricuspid valve. This is the neo tricuspid valve en face, looking at it opening and closing like a mouth. Here it is again. So this is at two years. The kid grows, the kid grew a lot. The valve grew with her and continues to function well. And this is video, he had to go back in for some other stage of her operation and just looked around at the valve. And again, this was the four ply, so it's fairly thick. But please note, this is a three-year-old child. Any neonate getting glutaraldehyde treated pericardium or any other biologic material implanted, this would have calcified by now. There's absolutely no question they would have had calcium in it. And this is a still soft and well functioning valve. Going back to the adults, patient with tricuspid endocarditis. This actually isn't one of my cases. I just thought it was kind of cool because it's got that big fungal ball in there. So this is a fungal endocarditis. And, uh, I included this because it has a good uh, intrap echo, and I couldn't find mine. I don't remember who the surgeon was for this, but this is probably one of the patients that was in our study that we, that we uh, presented in 2014. That was the tricuspid valve. And now you see the new tricuspid valve, right? See how pretty it is? Like the gull wings? That's how they all look right after surgery. It looks like a normal tricuspid valve. As a matter of fact, in follow-up, these patients, my cardiologists always read them as normal tricuspid valves. So this was actually, this was my first one. And, uh, this was an 18-year-old guy, 
septic shock, on the vent, renal failure, wasn't getting any better, took him to the operating room and took this mess of a tricuspid valve out for him. It turned out to be a nice young man. And carved all this out, this is what was left of the tricuspid valve, and built him a new valve at the table. Now I show you this because I want you to understand we kind of went through iterations. When we were first doing this in the animals, we thought we needed to anchor it more thick, they had to have a thicker uh, segment for, for around the annulus, and we, we had to have double layers at the papillary muscles. All this stuff you see me doing where I'm going to fold this over and I'm going to fold these over, you don't need to do it. As a matter of fact, the less, it, the less you have is better. And in fact, as we went to the two-ply and just made a cylinder, it was better. But I built it at the table, and these limbs, I'm actually going to fold these over because I thought I needed a little bit, something a little more solid to purchase on the valve. These are stitches in the papillary muscles, going down into the papillary muscles. They're foroprolines with um, pledgets of extracellular matrix. Going up through the cylinder, you can see it's folded over here. Cylinder gets dropped in, it's attached to three papillary muscles. So in the annulus and under pressure, we get a trileaflet valve. Close the pericardium. So that's him when I saw him a month later. And that's actually me, the little old man there. And then this is his echo three years later. And this is interpreted by my cardiologists who are specialists in echocardiography as a normal repaired tricuspid valve because they see on the report that the patient's had a repair. So that's how it gets interpreted. It's a beautiful valve. It's just a little bit of closing volume regurgitation that's been there forever. And this is, let me see if I can get this to run. This is my patient now. That's that same guy, he deadlifts 505 pounds. So uh, we've done well by him, and he's done well by us. Uh, this is a lady, uh, she's actually an achondroplastic dwarf, uh, came in with horrible endocarditis, said she'd never used IV drugs, but at the same time, her husband was in another hospital with third degree burns from his meth lab exploding. <laughs> now, what I learned that day, did you know that a meth lab isn't like a trailer like you see in Going Bad or whatever that series is? Gone Bad or whatever it is, Breaking Bad. It's, a, it's a, like a two-liter Coke bottle, and they make it in this thing, and so it exploded on them. So I learned some that day. So you find, yeah, apparently you can find these things on the side of the road, keep your kids away. The, uh, so she had, she had her valve, when I met her, her blood pressure was 30, she was on wide open levo and epinephrine, she was in renal failure. I kind of just walked by the room and said, guys, I'd like to help, but this, even I'm not going to operate on her. I meet her a month later, she's fine. And the problem is, though, her tricuspid valve is gone. So uh, we get her decubitus ulcer to heal. And we, she's up moving again. So I bring her into the office. We talk. We plan to do the ECM valve. And, but her right ventricle had grown quite a bit. So in her, I extended the anterior portion of the cylinder to accommodate that and built a little bit longer there to reach this anterior papillary muscle that had been displaced by the right ventricle enlarging and ended up with a nicely functioning valve. She did well with that. So now we're, we're into the FDA tricuspid feasibility trial. We have eight participating centers. Um, I'm the only one who has actually enrolled anybody so far. I've got two cases done in the study. I've, so I've used the, the new valve, the, the two-ply cylinder, which is gorgeous. I've, I've put two in in the study, and I've put two in compassionate use because I'm not going to go back to the four-ply if I, I have the two-ply in my operating room. So two people fit the study. Two people I couldn't enroll, but I put it in. So I've got four in. I've got another one a week from this Friday. So we'll have another. Uh, we're splitting it between uh, kids and adults. This is an awesome case. So this is a ca compassionate case use in a neonate, congenital heart disease, severe mitral dysplasia. This is a kid who's got a mitral valve, not a tricuspid valve. So it's going to be kind of neat to watch this kid grow and see how that behaves in the mitral position. Uh, this is my most recent patient, um, or one of my more recent patients. I just saw her yesterday, so I thought I'd throw this in. Uh, but this was her echo. She came into the office to see me yesterday at six weeks. And this is the two-ply. Two-ply is really nice, super soft. Uh, it's the thickness of a normal tricuspid leaflet, behaves like a tricuspid valve. Future direction, so where are things going to go? As I mentioned before, the composition of the matrix is key. That's what's going to determine how much 
of the embryologic or the uh, pluripotential cells, stem cells, will integrate into the material and then how they'll behave. So Dr. Matheny and the others working with him in his lab are looking at ways to modify without compromising the extracellular matrix. That said, if you're going to pick a matrix, they happened to pick the best one because the small bowel turns its cells over constantly, right? Every 10 days, you get a new lining in your small bowel. So that extracellular matrix, if we compare it to the matrices I showed you at the beginning, which were the fetal, neonatal, and adult, the matrix for small bowel is like neonatal. So it promotes cell growth uh, and development and, and, and attracts the cells. Um, so design, augment, augmenting the matrices to better recapitulate the embryologic milieu, which I just talked about, and then designs for applications that allow the body to complete, form, adapt, regenerate. Uh, they're, you know, it's, this is about growing things in vivo, allowing, allowing you to provide something for the patient that works now that will work later as your own tissue. So thank you.